Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Is this a line from some fantasy novel? No, it's a verse from the King James Bible. But what does it actually mean? Stay tuned and find out. Today I'll be looking at unicorns in the Bible as a lighthearted way of explaining why I don't recommend the King James Version of the Bible for serious theological study. Before I dive in, I want to say I have no problem with anyone who wants to use the King James. If you like the language it uses for casual reading, great. The best Bible translation is always the one you'll actually read. What I do have a problem with is people who claim the King James is the best translation or worse, claim that it is directly inspired by God and the only valid translation. These claims simply have no intellectual basis, and in reality there are far more accurate translations available today. The word unicorn appears nine times in the King James Bible, which I'll put in a pinned comment for reference. Most of the verses are metaphors, and so don't necessarily create a problem if the Bible refers to a mythical animal. Others, such as Isaiah 34, 7, seem to be describing a real animal, however. And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bollocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. People committed to the inerrancy of the King James who are aware of this problem will often point to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary that shows that unicorn could refer to the Asian rhinoceros at the time. An 1828 American Dictionary is not exactly a valid source for the meaning of a word in 1611 Great Britain, but checking a valid source does indeed show that the usage was known. The Oxford English Dictionary records a 1398 source which reads, In that lawn be of the rhinocotra, that is, the unicorn, a beast with un horn. Let's assume for the moment that this is actually what the King James means. This brings me to the first and, in my opinion, most serious objection to using the King James. Words have changed in meaning since 1611. Unicorn could possibly refer to a rhinoceros in 1611, but it definitely can't today. Archaic words simply can be looked up in a dictionary if needed, but words with changed meaning will fool the modern reader every time. Even if the King James was 100% faithful to the original languages, it didn't mean the same thing in 1611 as you might think it means today. In the case of unicorns, this is a minor oddity the reader will likely skim over, but there are around 400 similar words with changed meanings, and some can cause serious theological misunderstandings. For example, Genesis 128 commands mankind to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. This has caused some to think that creation was refilling the earth due to the modern meaning of replenish. However, in 1611, the word simply meant to fill, just as modern translations use. Now returning to the question of what the King James translators actually meant. Edward Topsell's History of Four-Footed Beasts, written in 1607, gives us a pretty good idea. At this time, people had no reason to believe the unicorn was not a real animal. Topsell describes it as rare, but unquestionably real animal, using the scripture and in other written accounts as proof. He does consider that the Hebrew re'em could mean rhinoceros, but rejects that possibility writing. We have already shewed in the story of rhinocerot that re'em in Hebrew signifieth a unicorn, although Munster be of another opinion. Yet the Septuagint in the translation of Deuteronomy 33 do translate it a unicorn, for the rhinocerot have not a one horn, but two. He then lists multiple scholars and rabbis who agree with the translation of unicorn. More on the Hebrew and Septuagint later. But where did the King James translators get this idea? Let's take a brief look at the history of the King James translation. Shortly after being ordained, James organized for an updated translation of the Bible. A number of motives were at play, including correcting errors in previous translations, updating language, making a version that supported the Church of England's view of church structure, and wanting to remove the Geneva Bible, whose marginal notes were deemed offensive to the Church of England, from common use. 
In the end, 47 scholars were chosen for the task, all members of the Church of England. The Bishop's Bible, which was the official Bible of the English Church, was used as the base text. The translators also consulted numerous English and foreign editions of the Bible, but not any original manuscripts. In the end, most of the bishop's readings were retained. Where changes were made, the text was most often changed to that of the Geneva Bible, but readings were also taken from various versions, including the Dewey Rhymes and Latin Vulgate. I mention these specifically because King James' only advocates sometimes try to claim that all other versions are Catholic conspiracies, when in actuality the King James translators were the ones making the text more Catholic, if such a thing even makes sense. This was done despite explicit instructions not to consult these translations. This brings me to my second reason for not thinking the King James is inspired. It's largely identical to the Bishop's Bible, but also takes readings from many other English versions, as well as features its own unique readings in some places. If the King James was directly inspired, that would mean that the Bishop's Bible is 80% or whatever percent inspired, and the Geneva Bible is 5% inspired, and so on. Plus, the motives for its creation were clearly political, which does not exactly inspire confidence in it being of divine origin. Looking at the word unicorn specifically, we can see all of the passages, with one exception, which I'll come back to later, came directly from the Bishop's Bible of 1568. Incidentally, the Bishop's Bible was brought about to counter the Geneva Bible because it was seen as supporting Calvinism. The Bishop's Bible, in turn, was based heavily on the Great Bible of 1539. The Great Bible itself was commissioned as the first official Bible of the Church of England to replace the Tyndale New Testament, which had been banned for its use of, quote, offensive language and notes. Ironically, the Great Bible took much of its text from Tyndale. Tracing backwards, we see the unicorn at every step. Tyndale's translation was indeed a fresh English translation not based on any existing English text. He was heavily influenced by Luther's German Bible and the Latin Vulgate. Luther's Bible uses Einhorn, the German word for unicorn, while the Vulgate varies. In about half its passages, it uses rhinoceros and in half unicornis, which simply meant one horned at the time of its composition. The Vulgate was mostly translated from the original Hebrew. Luther himself mostly based his translation on the Septuagint, which reads monokeros in all but one place. The other uses a generic term for mighty one, not identifying a specific animal. Monokeros simply means one horned and does not necessarily refer to a specific animal. So we can see we have some combination of Tyndale, Luther, and the Septuagint as bearing most of the blame for the unicorn translation. But what about the exception I mentioned earlier? This brings me to my third reason for thinking the King James is not the best translation. In some cases, they introduced errors that were not seen in any previous translations. Deuteronomy 33.17 reads, His glory is like the firstling of the bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. That sounds innocent enough, but when we read the Bishop's Bible, we find, His firstborn ox hath beauty, and his horns are as the horns of an unicorn. Notice the difference? Unicorn is singular in the Bishop's, and indeed all previous English translations, but the King James makes it plural. Looking at the Hebrew, horns is plural and the animal is singular, so the King James is simply wrong here. The translators apparently thought that scripture was in error, and so intentionally changed it to read unicorns to match the multiple horns. This is unambiguously an error on the translator's part and obscures the hint that the animal could not possibly be the one-horned horse, or even a rhinoceros. Which brings us to our final question. What does the Hebrew word, that is, re'em, actually mean? From Deuteronomy, we can see that the re'em has multiple horns. Multiple passages describe it as an animal of great strength and associated with danger. In two places, it is closely associated with cattle. 
That's the extent of the biblical data and just about all the King James translators had to go on. And that leads me to my final and most obvious reason not to use the King James. We've learned a lot in the last 400 years. In 1611, Biblical Hebrew was essentially a dead language, and other languages of the ancient Near East were barely known at all. Since then, immense amount of research have been done on Biblical Hebrew, and we've discovered tens of thousands of tablets that have brought to life Ugaritic, Akkadian, and other close cousins of Hebrew. The King James translators did an admirable job with what they had available to them, but we simply have much better information available today. So what does Re'em mean? We have close cognates in Akkadian, Syriac, and Ugaritic, and scholars are now confident that the animal in question is the Aurochs, a large wild cattle species that went extinct in the Middle Ages. As such, nearly all modern translations use wild ox or something very similar for the passages in question. But cattle have two horns, so how did the Septuagint and Vulgate come to describe one-horned animals. The image on the screen will help explain. Here we see a hunting scene from Nineveh made around 700 BC. The animal in the center is the aurochs, depicted in profile with one horn. On the ground we see a second aurochs, also with one horn. And this image is hardly unique. Here's another image, this one from Babylon. Note the extremely similar horn shape. And finally, some clay tablets from Assyria. These and many similar depictions of the animal show that there was an artistic convention that normally pictured it with one horn. Likely what happened is the Greek and later Latin translators were unsure of the exact animal meant. Translation of animal names is notoriously difficult or lacked a specific word for the aurochs. Either way, they knew it was typically shown as a one-horned cattle. Possibly, the one horn was even a common nickname of the animal. As such, the translators chose to call it the one horn. As the species grew rare and memory faded, the meaning of the translation was forgotten. When legends of the unicorn arose in later times, people read that horned horse back into the text, a meaning that was never actually there. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more videos examining the Bible in its original languages, hit that subscribe button and comment below with any questions you'd like to see addressed. Thanks for watching.